Yeah, welcome to Shanghai. Uh, I think uh, this is first a very, very special group, so not from education, but from press, right? Huh? Usually, uh, I got some friends from the States, usually they come from the uh, education, or they took charge of education uh, from the registration or from the Department of Education in the state, different states or in the national level. But this is the first time I face uh, to the press, right? So uh, I think maybe I can answer the questions. Usually it is very difficult for me or us to answer the questions from the press, right? Some very subtle, some, I mean, very difficult to answer. Right? I will try to welcome not only to Shanghai, but also welcome your challenge. So I use a title called Challenges and Changes for Development of Education in China. I think it is just a, uh, just a special time. In the year 2010, we have a new period of long-term educational plan. We call it the Education Development Plan for 2010 to 2020. So I just uh, cut into two parts for the two, uh, 20, uh, 20 years. The first 10 years and then the second 10 years. So at that time, I mean, in the end of last century, we faced a lot of, of problems, just like challenges. So we changed a lot in the last 10 years, and now we just come to the second phase. From the 2010, at that time, the special time, we meet another group of uh, problems. So we face those, those kind of challenges. We have the plans, and these days, we just uh, try to overcome that. So I divide into two periods of time. Yeah, I want to have several sub, I mean topics, the picture, the challenges at a time, how we spend our education at a time, and the main experiences in my mind, and what kind of new challenges for us to do, and how we overcome them. So especially, I will tell you what we will do and what we already done. So this is China. It is a very large territory, population, administration. Administration is very easy to remember. One, two, 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 should be, two, should be three. Yeah? And then four and five. One means Taiwan, very special places. It is a province, so if we put the first one into the 22, then two, two, three, four, five. Two are two special administration area, Hong Kong and Macau. And the 22, in fact, the 23, including Taiwan, are ordinary provinces. Then the four, four are metropolises directly affiliated to the central government, that means uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin and Chongqing, there are four. And the five are for ethnic minority groups, we call it, or minority ethnic group, autonomous regions. So five regions, like Xinjiang, Tibet, Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, and others, um, Ningxia and Guangxi or something like that. So, Two, two, three, four, five. Let's cover all our provinces. Right. And the GDP, I think, totally is quite large, but dividing to 1.3 billion people, it is not very hard, only 6,000 something. Industry, for the structure, first industry agriculture, 10%. Manufacturing, 24, 20, oh no, 45%. And the third industry, service industry, 44. But it's quite different from Shanghai. In Shanghai, only 1% for agriculture, more than 60% for service industry. Right? And it is very important in the old government experiences, financial experiences, 4% of GDP coming to education. It is realized just in the year. 2012. It is a very important, I mean, indicators. The Chinese people tried 40 years to realize that. So at that time, the China is very poor, so we have a lot of things to do. So the government have only usually around 3% GDP coming to education. 
But in China, we have such kind of saying: if you want your horse going very fast, please give some food for them. So if you want a good education, just try to put the um, investment. So for that, I do a lot for the government. I give a lot of suggestions. Uh, give give a lot of evidence of why we should put there. So we realized, and Xi Jinping, the new president, continued. He said that we already realized the four percent of GDP into education, but we will continue and increase that. I think it is for education. It's a good news, right? So this is education. High education. We have more than two thousand institutions. The uh, the PG is postgraduate. UG means undergraduates, so a lot of people. T means teachers. Staff are non-teaching staff. So this is the picture about education in the year 2012. 2012. So the education, if for the skills, we can say the largest skills because we have the largest population. We have 1.3 billion. If you consider about that, it is maybe not so big. Right? So at that time, we faced a lot of challenges. The first thing is difficult for the government to have the finance to meet the people's demand of education. So after during、uh, after Cultural Revolution, all the people considered education is very important. It's a part of our dream. So all the people want to have their education, but at that time, we have a very large but poor country, and all the people, all the children want their children. Oh. Uh, all the people want their children to have good education. So, in the end of last century, of early this century, we have the most serious problem is the money. How to get money to have high education and the secondary education, right? So this is the first one. So at that time, the schools are very, I mean, school conditions are very poor. I once worked in the countryside. I first taught in the rural mountain area, and then come back to the cities. And at that time, I taught in the primary and secondary schools, and then after that, I come to the university. So I studied in China and taught in China, and then I taught in the other countries. I once taught in Virginia, right? I tried to have my experiences, and I studied in Oxford. So I want to have some experiences in England. So I said I learn how to do education. I want some chances to work in your primary and secondary schools. So I understand that. I can see the corporations there, right? And of course, after that, I become so called the experts. So I was invited by World Bank, I invited by UNICEF, I invited by UNESCO. So the poorest country is Cambodia and Nigeria. So I told both in the developed countries and also developing countries, right? So I know that the financial problems is always one of them, right? The skills of high education and senior secondary education was far beyond the needs of the people because of the time money. So we cannot enlarge the high education and senior secondary immediately. So we we try to in many ways. And another problem is it is a little bit special. I think it is similar to China to Anglo-Saxon countries. It is different from the、uh, European un- the continent countries in. Uh, Germany, in Netherlands, there is no problems. All the people like the vocational education, technical education. But in China, in United States, in England, people don't want to send their children to vocational schools. They said that they will lose their hope because if you train in as a worker, so in the future life you almost lose a chance to be professional. So China, it is similar to the United States and to the、uh, the UK. The rich people, the intellectuals, don't want to send their children to the vocational schools. It is the same. So we face a lot of challenges. On one hand, the government, if they want to open the vocational schools, they need more money, because the vocational schools not only need the blackboard, the 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 PPT or the the、uh, such kind of machine. They should have a lot of really machines. And、uh, a lot of materials for the children. So, if you want to open some vocational schools, in fact, is even much much expensive than the high schools, right? So we have on one phase, on one side, 
the government have no money, so it is not easy to open the vocational schools. And after uh, then, if you open, rich people don't want to send their children, so they are not so at attractive. So we have both the dilemma. On one hand, it's very expensive. On the other hand, don't, the people don't want to go, so face a very serious problems at that time. Then the quality of the universalization of compulsory education is unsatisfied uh, satisfied in the cities. Although we declare that we universalized five, uh, nine years of compulsory education, that means all the children have nine years free uh, primary and junior secondary education. But, but the problem is the people considered the qualities are not high, especially in the rural area. So although we declare that we have the compulsory education, but all the people say, oh, the quality is the problem at that time. Then the fifth educa uh, education development was in seriously disparity, especially in rural areas. Our problems is not in Shanghai, but in the rural areas. Then the workload of the primary and secondary school children are heavily burdened, even overheard. Uh, 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 overburden. So all the peace students uh, have to do maybe three hours homework after their schools. So it is a lot. But now in these days, the United States and a lot of countries, they said, oh, please increase some hours for children to do their homework. But here we said, oh, try to reduce some hours for them to develop their own potentials. So just in the opposite ways, all right. So this is our problems, then how we solve that. So in the last 10 years, we tried in every way to develop <coughs> our higher education. So this is the development. The development of the higher education for the students' numbers, so developed very, very quickly, right? Very quickly. This is for enrollment for the year 1998. In a year, we only have a one million something of the new university freshmen. But in the year 2010, we have six million. So just uh, six times, how could? It is a very, very brief plan, right? So we just uh, jumped in the last 10 of our higher education numbers. And uh, so, so many students come to university, then we need classrooms and the buildings and the dormitories. So in Shanghai, you see the campus are developed. The buildings are built, right? Built. So just as you see in three times for our, the school campuses, and uh, a lot of buildings are built last, just like uh, last 10 years. So in, even in the Fudan University, you can see there are a lot of new buildings, less than five, uh, 10 years. Even Fudan got a new campus nearby, right? So they have that old, uh, you come to the old campus, but after maybe 10 kilo, 10, 10, 10 kilo uh, outside of the city, they have a, another new campus. And because of that, we need our teachers. So the teachers jump, uh, jumped, the numbers are jumped. So developed very quickly. We have a lot of Teachers come back from the other countries, just like me. I studied in other countries then. I was recalled by the government and invited by university, so I, can't, I said, oh, well, I can't come back, all right. Yeah. Yes, because all the development, the growth rate of higher education, that means in the age of 18 to 22, the growth rate of this age group developed very quickly. In the year 2000, only 12.5% 12 uh, 12 of the age group can come to university. But now, in the 10 years, it just doubled, right? 24%. So when I was in the university, I, I come into the university in 1978, the first group of the Cultural Revolution, I come to university. At that time, only less than 1% of the young people can come to the university, but now, 24. In last year, I was told now more than 26. So developed very quickly. And I, when I worked in the government, I worked as a 
uh, vice director general for education commission, just like our department of education and government. I took charge of entrance examination and higher education and also the master plan. I, uh, in the year uh, 2009, I was invited to give a lecture in, the, uh, in Oxford University. And they asked me, oh, how developed? I said, yes, you have the plan. In the 2010, the UK uh, higher education growth rate come to the 50%. 50% of the age group. Then I asked them, or they asked me, how about Shanghai, I said, 24, oh, China, 24, I said. Yeah, then, then I said, can you guess how high is in Shanghai? They said, maybe 30 or 40. I said, we already come to the 65%. In Shanghai, 65%. That means in the age group of 18 to 22, 22 100 students, among 100 students, uh, young people, more than 60 students can have the higher education. So, they are very quickly, right? This is in higher education. Then, higher education is also, we try to not only to enlarge our, I mean, sk sk uh, skills, but also try to develop its quality, right? Raise the quality. So, in a year, um, yes, 1993, when the Peking University come to one century's uh, anniversary, Jiang Zemin went there. He said that in the 21st century, we try to have established around 100 well-known universities in the world. I mean, 100 universities. We have more than 2,000. So we can only choose some universities with good base to develop to be a high university, a uh, high good university. <coughs> so we call it Project 211. That means the 21st century, 100 well-known universities. And then we come to another one. We come to another one. In the year two, uh, no, 98, the President Zhang Zemin said again, in the future, in the 21st century, Maybe we have several world-class universities. Maybe Beijing, Zhao, uh, Zhao, uh, the Tsinghua, Fudan, Zhao Tong University will come to the top universities in the world. So we call it 98.5. That means because the things happening in May, the fifth month. So 98 means year 1998. Five means the May, uh, the, the month, fifth month, right? So Chinese people may be good at math, so they always try to put on the numbers of our project, project two one one, project nine eight five, right? Mm. So since then on, China tried to start its development of the first class research universities and the excellent key point academic disciplinaries. I think it, it has some international influence. So after that, Japan also have the excellent research centers. And uh, Germany also tried to have nine great universities, right? Such kind of things. Just now I said something about the, uh, the higher education. Then we come to see the basic education. So it is very important. The, Jew, the senior secondary developed very, very quickly. So when the people have their junior education, then they need the senior education. But at that time, the government is poor. But now, developed very rapidly. See, the senior schools jumped. The most important students jumped three times. So when they, they have the, the junior secondary education, after their composer education, the government provides the senior secondary and the family will ask their children to go on the senior secondary. So the senior secondary developed very quickly. So try to solve the problems that we faced, just now I said, they just first try to raise the quality of compulsory education in rural area. So this is important. So in the year 2000, year, uh, in the 2000 years, we declared, we generally universalized, uh, universal nine-year compulsory education and then 
try to have the boarding schools. In European countries, boarding schools means almost means the private schools, uh, bus, you know, bus schools. But in China, different. The boarding schools, the rural area, that means for the poor children. Because in the rural areas, there are not so many people, but their children should be educated. So if they will have to uh, commute, then many miles they have to go. So just have some boarding schools. Then the children can stay there, and only in the weekend they come back. So in the remote rural areas and mountain areas, we set up a lot of boarding schools. Of course, that is very, that are, um, they will be very expensive. So the government put a lot of money on that. And then we have the free exemptions, not only for tuitions, but also for the school books, exercise books. So that try to realize the real, not only compulsory, but free education. In this way, the children can be trained in, uh, in the schools. So for the poor rural children, they are also given a living allowance because when they come to boarding, boarding schools, the family have the extra expense. So those kind of expense cannot be covered by the rural peasants. So the government to give them the money. Right? And they try to modernize the educational equipment. So after that, in the cities, they have all the very good buildings. But how about the children in the countryside? So we try to modernize the educational equipments. So this is trying to improve the educational conditions but the most important for the teachers. If no good teachers want to come into rural areas, then they still have the problems. So we have a lot of devices to solve the problems in the countryside. So since then, we have the teacher certificate. So if you want to be a teacher, you have to have, to have the license, including what to teach and how to teach. You should graduate from the I mean, related subjects. If you want to be a physics education teacher, you should have the, uh, you should develop in the from the physical department, uh, uh, physical science departments, right? And after that, you should not only know how, what to teach, but you should know how to teach. Then maybe you should have the educational degrees or education certificate. So, from that year, the first year, the whole nation needs a teacher certificate. But in the, before that, 10 years ago, Shanghai had the first. Shanghai usually tried to do the first step. After 10 years, the China will do that. Then in year 2006, we have the special working place teachers project for the rural teachers. So after graduate from the universities, the, some university students want to be some volunteers and working several years in the countryside, but they cannot devote their whole life there. So we should have special places. Let the young graduates to work there for several years. After that, they can come back to the cities. So in this way, more and more graduates come to the rural areas. Then in the year 2007, we have the tuition-free student teacher's education. That means if you want to be a teacher, when you come to university, you can get a free higher education. Usually, the Shanghai, uh, usually in the country, higher education, you should have the paid tuition fees. But if you are student teachers, you can get a free higher education. Of course, this is also trying to encourage the people to become the teachers, right? And in the year 2008, we have the requirement, when you, to be a you, you are already a teacher, you should have the service training. So in the five, first five years of the new teachers, have to spend 360 hours to be trained in service training. In the weekends, in the summer vacation, in the winter vacation, you have your training. So in this way, you improve your teaching and the government will pay the in-service training. When you have the training programs, the government will give the universities or other training institutions the money for the teachers in service teachers training and after that maybe you trained you get a high degrees or certificates then you improved and you raise your income 
So the surveys were going on. So I think when I would come to Canada, they said, oh, it is impossible in our states. We have the problems. After work, how can you ask me to do being service training? Right? Why we should go that? So then I tell them, here, we can. Because the central government and the local government will pay you the training fee, the tuitions. And after that, you got a certificate and improve your teaching, and you can improve your income, salary, so why not? So I think that this is very important. So your Ministry of Education, I mean the Department of Education, asked me to write a report to them. In the United States, in many states, they have no professional letters for teachers. They said, we are a profession. So we are in the work, a teacher's union. How can we have different levels? They said, we are a profession. We have professional awareness. I don't think it's a good way. Because after they are 40 and uh, maybe 50 or something like that, they said, oh, I'm very skillful in teaching. But they did not work very hard. Or say, maybe they did not improve their new teaching Method, uh, methods, right? Approaches. But ours, we have the letters. You have a lot of letters to go. They said, how can? We have no such common tradition. I said, oh, I gave you a question. Professor, professors in the universities, whether they are the professional or not. They said, of course, university professors are the professionals. Then I asked them, why university professors, they can assist the professors, associate professors, the professors and the full professors. Why they can have their letters, professional letters. Why we primary and secondary school teachers can have no professional letters. If you have the letters, if your social status is much higher than now, and your salaries will raise, why not? And in this way, the government pay them more money, and the students are the final beneficiaries. They get a better education, right? So it will be good. So we have such kind of things. Of course, also in, in Shanghai first, we began in 90, 90, uh, 1990. After 10 years, it is success, uh, succeeded. Then the central government said, yes, now Shang, the whole China should do. And if you want to get a promotion, you should have another 540 hours. So, of course, we reform our curriculum and teaching approaches. So we have three rounds. I don't want to teach uh, too much. And uh, we have three waves from the universalized or centralized curriculum to individualized, the innovation-oriented curriculum. And we changed our curriculum, we changed our teaching approaches. Right. So we get something, we get something. So after 10 years, we got a result. Shanghai joined the PISA in the three year, uh, in program of international student assessment. It is organized not by Chinese people or by the Western people, right? By OECD, organization for economic and the cooperation development. I think it is a club, a rich club. Only the rich countries can join that. Because in Asia, only, Europe, uh, only Japan and Korea are the members. We are not. But we are invited by the OECD say, oh, try to come. So Shanghai comes, right? Shanghai try to see <coughs> what performance, I mean, Shanghai status in the world, and try to learn the latest te uh, techniques in the educational evaluation and try to have our evidence-based policy making and uh, policy improvement. So we join that. And all of a sudden, we come to the top. In reading, math and science, all the three subjects, Shanghai come to the top. The number one in the world, right, suddenly. So all the people come to me and ask me, What's your secrets? How can you do so well in the last 30 years? So I consider about that. So I was invited by the UK. This is the UK Minister for Education. I was invited by Gelata in, the, in Australia. This is the lady Prime Minister in, Gelata, uh, in Australia. I was invited by your government, at uh, Duncan, Minister Duncan, right? 
uh, in in Hilton in New York. Right. So they invited me to to tell the stories. Then I was invited. Uh, some people come to visit. Um, one of a very well known, I mean, uh, journalist, the column writer, <coughs> Tom uh, Friedman, yeah. come to visit me, right? <laughs> and uh, he uh, gave me his book, <laughs> and uh, he want, yeah, and uh, he want to know the Shanghai secrets. So he went to a lot of Shanghai schools. But I said, before I tell you the Shanghai secrets, please keep in mind the preconditions. If you keep that in your mind, then I can tell you the secrets. The same to you, right? <laughs> so the first is, you should remember, Shanghai is only a part of China. It, it cannot be a good or right representative of China. So typical province is just like Anhui, Henan, those kind of provinces in the middle of China, they are typical Chinese one. Because they are quite big rural areas. But Shanghai is only a city just like New York. I don't think New York can be the representative of the state for United States. Shanghai is not. It's an exceptional one. Maybe Shanghai is the picture or window see the Sh China's future. So usually, the things happening in China, if uh, things happening in Shanghai, if it is succeeded, then 10 years or 20 years later will be in China. So I don't know how many cities you will visit. Only in Shanghai or several cities? Only Shanghai. Oh, sorry. Then next time, you should, you should go to other cities. I think in my mind, you should go to three cities. One is Shanghai. If you want to see what happened in the last 25 years or 30 years, and what will be happened in the next 25 years, I mean a quarter in the future, that means 50 years, you come to Shanghai. Only see the 50 years, you can guess, oh, from Shanghai, we can see maybe in the future in China. And you can see, oh, Shanghai now, 20 years ago, maybe not that. The stories about that will be that whole China today. If you want to know the modern China, if for five years, come to Beijing. Beijing will show you the palace, the capital, the emperor's house. So you can see from the feudal society to the semi-colonial, semi-federal, then the socialist, right? And then the, after culture, the cultural revolution, then they opened all policies. So the five years, 500 years, you can come to Beijing. Then, if you want to see the history of China for 5,000 years, come to Xi'an. Then, you can see the soldiers on the ground, right? <laughs> so, the three city, cities are very, very typical. Shanghai is only one of them. So, Shanghai is not a good representative of China. So, don't worry about that. They say, oh, Shanghai now is come to the first. So, we worry about that. It's different, right? Then, the second, I think. Reading, math, and science are very important study areas in the basic education, yet basic education means much more and much greater. Right? Not only the children come to schools to learn math. All the society want their children, next generation, to be the responsible citizens. But PISA did not test that. And all the families, the parents want their children to live happily and develop their own personal potentials. But it is too difficult to test. So there is no such kind of test. Because all the potentials are different. So we consider the basic education is much greater than reading, math, and science. So when I meet the uh, vice minister from Brazil, they're worried about that because they are very, very low in math. Then I, I, I said, oh, don't worry about that. It is just an index. Index. It is an indicator. Mass means not all. Not means all. You have very good football. You see, compared with the whole football, Shanghai Chinese people are hopeless. 1.3 billion people cannot select 11 persons, right? <laughs> so I think... All right, yes. Thank you. Yeah. And then the basic education is only a part of education. 
Yet education is a much grander and social areas, including higher education, vocational education, lifelong learning. Of course, higher education is much better in the United States than in China. So all the Chinese people come to the United States to learn, right? And I come to Oxford, why? Because the UK is good, very, very good. We can see the modernization, the process of education, right? Development of uh, education. In some countries, uh, in Denmark, in uh, uh, Nordic countries, uh, their lifelong learning develops very, very well. And in Germany, in Netherlands, uh, their vocational education is very well. So we just uh, start in the basic education, because we still should keep our eyes open to learn from the world, right? So Shanghai come to the top, yet we should remember PISA is not the Olympic Games for gold medals, but for the policy making and the policy improvement. We can see our blindness, shortcomings, problems, the areas we shall reform, right? So I, sh I think we shall remember that. So after the PISA, so we learned a lot of things and we are really, really excited. Then, now, I, 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 we can have a choice. You can ask questions or I can give you the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe se several questions first, then I'll give you the secrets. <laughs> okay, please. Um, what's the situation like for immigrants here? Are immigrants allowed uh, you know, to, to attend school? If so, through what age? If so, what sorts of immigrants? Um, I, I'm particularly interested in, in, in African immigrants in Guangzhou and other places um, in those populations. I'll be going to school. Okay. I said in Shanghai we have uh, two groups of uh, immigrants. One is the real immigrants from foreign countries. So those kind of immigrants in Shanghai, no problem. Because I think maybe the, the immigrants' structure are different. In Guangzhou, there are a lot of, I mean, the people who just uh, do very, very small business, right? But in Shanghai, usually foreigners, just like you, intellectuals, experts, the, 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 the high-level staff in the I mean, uh, big, country, uh, big, big, big cross-border the, the, the companies, right? So no problem. In Shanghai, we have uh, more than 30, 30 foreign schools because a lot of people, they come to Shanghai, but they don't want to come to Shanghai schools. They say, because you, 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 your math is too serious, right? So we just come to American schools. So no problem. In Shanghai, there are three American schools. There are two, two uh, British schools. They have a school for Germany and Fran uh, French people. And of course, the local school, schools, they absorb some foreigners. And uh, they have the advantages. The local students, they come to school just uh, nearby. So the students uh, in this area, they should stay in here, this area. You cannot say, oh, that school is very good, we send to that, because we should keep the equal. But if you are foreigners, no problem. You can choose whatever you want. So this group we call the international migrants, no problems. Another group we call the domestic migrants, that means that they come from uh, different provinces. They have uh, different dialects. They have uh, different uh, behaviors. They usually they are poor. Their fathers usually they are peasants. I mean farmers. And now they come to try to find uh, jobs in China, in, uh, in Shanghai. So they are very, very special migrants. They are not from other countries, but from other provinces. Then in Shanghai, we try to give them very good uh, education. Because uh, this group, we considered not only for their personal human right, their right of development. You should give them uh, education. Another thing is, if the society did not give them the good education, then you, yourself, after 20 years, you have the problems, right? So I was invited by the, the, the Brazil government and also Me Mexico government to solve their problems because they are a, there are a lot of domestic migrants from a rural area to the big cities in Mexico and Brazil. Now they have the security problems. So in China, in Shanghai, we already see those kind of lessons. So we should overcome them. So just try to let them to have good education. 
So although we come to the the top one in the world, in the uh, test 2012, we have already 26 percent children who take the examination are the migrants. That means the domestic migrants. So they still come to the top, so it's good. But I still say to the government, it will be a serious challenge. Because in a, that year, in the 2012, in the primary grade one, primary school grade one, that means really kids, more than 52 are belong to the domestic migrants. The local students only 48. So our city is jumped very, very quickly. When I was in the university, Shanghai only uh, 13 million people. But after 30 years, how many you get? We have 24 million in Shanghai. And also every, fi uh, every day, 5 million, oh, 5, no, not 5 million, 0 0.5 million. That means uh, 500,000, right? 500 thousands are floating. So this is the city situation. 24 million, almost as Australia, plus another 500 thousand people. But, but to the, excuse me, to the part of my question of, I mean, of the tens of, th tens of thousands of African immigrants living in Guangzhou and other places, mm -hmm. you're, you're saying, I mean, they're here doing business, and I theoretically, for short periods of time, many yeah. live. Yes, right yes. You're saying their kids go to school, local yeah. school. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, in Guangzhou, I'm not very familiar with okay. the situation, but I'm sure the city have to offer them the chances of education. Okay. It will be the same problem. I don't still think those Africans will come back. Most of them will stay in Guangzhou and China. If you did not give them the development chances, they will be your burden of the cities. So, both for the personal individual I mean, benefits, also for the city's benefits. Both of them, as in my mind at least, you should give them the education. Right, please. Can, can you talk about right. the, social, the social problems and social challenges that arise from, all, from these migrants coming to cities like Shanghai and not having the job opportunities that, right. that, they, ex that they are increasingly demand? What, what, is, what is it going to be like in the coming years? Is this going to get worse? But in Shang in oh, I, I don't think it will be worse. In fact, uh, Shanghai now needs uh, more people. Because uh, when the people are getting rich, they will come back into their hometown. Because in here, the, the, the living conditions are maybe not so good. And then after they get some knowledge and the techniques, they come back to their home town to open their own small business there. So in these days, when the, the cost of living and the cost of uh, uh, the, the, the social cost were well, getting higher and higher, more and more young people, they just uh, try to do several, to do the work for several years and then come back. So in Guangzhou now, they just uh, try to attract the rural people to the cities. So in this way, that means almost uh, no employment problems. And then if there are no employment problems, they will be secure. And then we pay attention to their children, right? Yeah, please. Let's ask you about corruption. So uh, I read that at Fudan, All right, yeah. there was a, yeah. a sweep of corruption and the president resigned. And uh, in talking to people here, it sounds like uh, the education sector uh -huh. is being targeted specifically for uh -huh. corruption. So I wanted to ask you, is that because there's been such growth and such progress, perhaps it's been a bit unbridled? What do you attribute the corruption to? Oh, yeah. Uh, I worked once as a university president. Maybe I was looks very young, right? Can you guess at my age? Twenty-five. <laughs> I'm now more than sixty. I'm now more than sixty, so I resign my uh, president uh, presidentship, but I come to the People's Congress. People's Congress, just like your uh, legis legislation, I mean your parliament. So I now work in the parliament as the vice chair for uh, vice chair for foreign affairs, international affairs. Yeah. I think maybe in the last 30 years our universities have developed very quickly. So where is the money? Usually the Chinese government, uh, Chinese universities borrow the money from from the banks. So if you have no eggs 
that but you want eggs but you have no the hands either, then you borrow some hands. So in the last 30 years, almost all the universities are enlarged. So I think in the, this process, some university and university presidents did very well. They put every penny on the development of the universities. I don't think there are such kind of people. Uh, I don't think all, everyone will did very well, right? Maybe the universities are getting rich. Maybe they also themselves are getting rich either, right? So I think there are such kind of pro uh, phenomena there. So the central government now, when the people are getting rich, so they said, oh, we can do that to, I mean, to against the, 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 the corruption, right? So in the last 30 years, almost uh, all the universities in China borrowed the money from the banks. So it is a very, very large and great. You can see from the buildings and the campus. They buy the camp, uh, they board the land, they, they build the buildings. Maybe in this process, they got something, private benefits, right? I think it's possible. But on the whole, I think it is great. Just like in the history of education, there is a very, very important lesson from the United States. They called land-granted universities and colleges, like uh, Texas A&M. They are still there. Cornell, the part of one, one part of Cornell is given by the state, New York, uh, New York State. So like that, it is a very good lesson and the models for the world, how to develop a country. The developed universities, you can give the money, some land to the universities. They can rent it, they can build a house on that, even they can sell, sell some lands to build their universities. But in China, you, especially in the cities, we have no land to buy, uh, to sell. The government cannot say, oh, I'll give you some land. So we have to buy. Buy, how can you buy? You have no money, no problem, <coughs> borrow money from the banks. So the World Bank and Asia Bank, Asia Development Bank, invited me to give the lectures about how we do that. Shanghai Normal University is a one of the first university who borrowed the money from bank and opened a new campus. Right. So it has succeeded. Now, I left my university, I said that, yeah, if the government asked me to return the money to, to, to the banks, yeah, it's very easy. I got a very large land, so I can cut one piece to the banks. I sell it. At that time, the land is very cheap. No people want to do in the, uh, uh, along the beach. But now, it is a very good area. All the people want to play in the beach. So if you want, I can sell one piece of that. But uh, the precondition is, please, sell, uh, please give all the land to me. Then I can be the landlord. So all the public universities uh, borrow the money from the banks. Now, the government, when they get rich, they return the money. I mean, the debt. So the, 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 even the bank, they like, to send, uh, they, they like to borrow the money for us because it is uh, reliable. The university will not be closed. The students are always there. So the government will pay it back. So if you ask the university, the president say, no problem, I can give you one building or two. Then I'll... Return all the money money's bank, right? Yes, so should I give you the secrets? Oh, <laughs> secrets. Okay, please. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned early on about the dilemma on uh, vocational education. Yes. And one of our earlier speakers, one or two, mentioned how important it will be for China to develop advanced manufacturing. Yes. Going to stay competitive. Yeah. So, are there um, initiatives underway to, oh, to yes. address? This is our new, I mean, uh, I, I don't think today uh, we have the time to next phase. I mean, very important to do our reform in technical education, I mean, vocational education. Try to attract a lot of people. At the first, I, I think uh, why? We, we should consider why the people don't want to have the vocational education. That means they will lose their future, right? For the families, uh, for the children themselves. So at that time, our vocational education means the secondary vocational education. That means even in the senior high school, you learn a lot of uh, very concrete skills. So you learn the, those kind of skills, you become the workers in this area. Then after maybe 20 years, the industry is not there. The skills you learn is useless. Then you have no future, then you become the middle age you said, oh, it is very difficult for me to learn new things. 
So they worried about their future, in fact. So we get related with the senior secondary vocational education with the high education. So we considered even the general education from primary, then secondary, then high education. Can we have the secondary vocational education and the high vocational education? So we just uh, changed from a special level of secondary education to a column, to a system. So we change it now from the secondary vocational education to the vocational education from the senior secondary to junior, just, just like uh, your, your community college. Short high education, we call it high vocational education. Then to the bachelor degree, then to professional master degree. So try to from the horizontal to vertical. Then the students will have the children, will have the future. And then another thing we can see that who are in the secondary education, vocational education? Most of them are poor families, children. Professors will not send their children into vocational schools. So the, even the poor families, they are, because they are very poor, if you want to attract them, try to have some benefits for them. Now, Shanghai government already done, maybe five years later, the other, uh, other provinces will do. In Shanghai, if you are you come into the vocational schools, in the high schools, you have your parents have to pay the tuition fees. But if you come to the vocational schools, because most of them are poor, you just omit their tuition fees, although much expensive, right? Vocational schools are much expensive than the ordinary high schools because they have a lot of materials. Then they should pay their tuitions, but you should have no. Even the poorer, we can get your grant. In the lunch, we give you free charge of lunch, right? A free lunch for you. So in this way, to help the poor, attract them to into the vocational schools and give them the future. Not only give their job training, but give some basic knowledge for them. So now it is already in Shanghai, have the results. We, I checked PISA in the year 2012. I get all the vocational kids scores out as a special group our children in vocational schools their mass scores in the world are just number six shanghai is number one the vocational schools are still have very high scores for their children so in shanghai we do it this way these two ways used together one way to put it as a level to the vertical the other way to give them more special financial support. Shanghai has succeeded, so I believe that China will do that after several years. Of course, they're based on the money, so when the precondition is the central government is getting even richer than now, all right? So we will do that. How about the secrets? secrets. All right, I'll give you. Very interesting, uh, very easy to do that. Yes, I still have the time, because at two, I had another meeting, right? So for your memory, Chinese people are like to memory something, memorize something. I said only four plus eight. Four are traditional. That means the whole country, it's culture. Then the modern ones are eight. They are new devices, right? So first of all, traditional ones. So I invite, yes, I, I will invite the, the, the uh, Confucius, all right? So in China, all the families have very high expectation in education. We have uh, many, many stories and the legends. From a rural family, of course, there is no rural families, to the farmers. They pay much attention to the, at the education. Just like the people, they believe that if you come to the United States, you can have your freedom. If you come to the United States, you are getting rich. If you come to the United States, then you will be happier. So a lot of people in the world, they come to the United States. But in China, we believe that if you have a good education, then you will become something, right? So this is the first one. 
Then the second is we have strong believing, diligence, and persist in hardworking, change the future of individuals and families. So we have a lot of stories. For the first one, had high expectation, we can, I can give you a story about Mencius. We have Confucius and Mencius. Mencius is just a dexter to Confucius. So there is a story said, Mencius' mother changed his or uh, her house, her home, into three, three times. At first, when Mencius is very, very young, was very, very young, his father died, passed away. So the mansion said, oh, we should move to the cemetery, nearby the cemetery, so we can see our father and show respect to them. After only less than one, uh, half a year, the mother said, oh, we should change the place. It is not a good place. Then the people asked them, why? You should say the respect to your parents. It's a good thing. They said, no. You see, how our children learn, what they learn, they only know how to do the service for the funeral ceremony. So it is good, not good, so we shall move. Then the people ask them, then the, what you shall learn? The, the, the parents said, uh, the, the mother said, oh, we shall learn the communication with the people who left the life so they can become the I mean, useful people to, to the world, to the society. Then the people said, oh, you can move to the market, to the downtown. So they, they moved to the downtown. Another half a year, the mother said, complained, said, oh, it's not good. So the downtown is not a good place. The people asked them, why you complain? She said that. Oh, you see, now our children can only have the shouting and the singing of the market, market I mean, advertisement sound, right? So some people said they are potato, they were, sh they were shouting special sound, right? Special term. They, 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 they sell the, the, the vegetables, they have special sounds. They have hammers, they were shouting. So this is, this is not a good way, right? Only learn the bugging and the shouting. Then the relatives ask them, how then, where you should move? Then they discussed. One of their relatives said, oh, if you really want your children to learn, move to nearby the school. So they moved there, and Manchus learned a lot and how to learn and the culture as a professional person, as an individual. So Manchus become just next to the Confucius, right? So this is the story. And then we have also stories that, um, to say about how to do work hardly, right? He said that at that time, 2,000 years ago, there is a Mr. Liu. He studied all day long, and in the evening, he studied what to do, and then, then he met a problem. Sometimes uh, when he reading, he will got a dozing. So he just hand himself with a soul to the, uh, uh, to the seals. Then in this way, he can only stand there and read. If he's dozing off, then all of a sudden he, he will wake up, right? <laughs> and uh, he even put some nails, yeah, put some nails on his I mean, legs. If you want to get up, the nail will I mean, hurt you, right? So in Chinese, we say, Tou xue liang zui zi gu. And then he became the prime minister in Han Dynasty. <laughs> so we have a lot of the stories. <laughs> yeah, even we. Even even we come from uh, come to the Einstein, we still said, oh, all the teachers will say the stories about Einstein to our children because a lot of students uh, like to know the foreigners, uh, experts in foreigners. He said they said 99 percent of the how do you say wet? How do you say Han Shui? Yeah, sweating. Uh, sweating, right? Ninety nine percent of the sweating and the 1% of the genius, and then the talents. In China, we just, uh, I mean, yeah, cultivate our children in this way, right? Then third, we have a very important, we pay very, very much respect to our teachers. We said the teachers as the <coughs> parents. Because in this years, now in modern society, we call the lao shi, means teacher. Lao means senior still show the respect to our teachers. But in old days, teacher means shifu. Shifu means teacher as your father. So I invite 
Confucius here. Confucius is our teacher. In China, we said he is a Chinese teacher for 10,000 generations. But the Kong's family, up to now, in the 2,000 years, only 76 generations. You see, that means forever. So the teachers are sure respected. During the Cultural Revolution, Mao was uh, flattered by a lot of people. They have a lot of titles. And they said, uh, Mao said, don't want to, uh, don't want to give, flatter me, give me so many titles. Then the people said, man, what title you need? He said, I, I want only one. The people said, what title you want? He said, a teacher. Right. So we showed a lot of I mean, respect to our teachers. Of course, these are important, but the most important is number four. We have the public open examination system as a mechanism that is a safeguard. Keep all the people believing you can through this fair play and come to the top. So in Chinese, we always say that don't ask the background, the family background of the heroes. Maybe the heroes come from very, very shabby, very, very low status families. Because they, if they study hard and pass examination, then they have the future. In China, we have another saying. In the morning, you are a farmer. In the afternoon, you pass the examination. And in the evening, you can be in sign law of the king or queen, right? Because if you come to number one, then all the people around will be around you, right? So the Chinese people believe that if you pass examination, then you can become somebody. So in fact, it is encouraged all people, no matter what kind of family. So they said, this is a safeguard for the top three, right? So it is very, very strong. We have a lot of examination, even before I'm come to the university president, I still given three tests. First test is a written test. So they give us some questions and you should answer the solve problems. And then the interview by a lot of uh, experts and the university president whether to see whether you are suitable to be a university president. And the, even the three, the psychological test on the computer, they say they give you a lot of dilemmas to see whether you can resilient to those kind of challenges for you, right? So we have a lot of uh, those kind of things. And uh, then, before that, all the people have the equal opportunity. So in Chinese people, we did not consider so much before the law, all the people are equal. But in the Chinese people believe, before the examinations, we are equal. Only past examination, then you can get a chance, right? So these are very important. These are traditional one, covered all the China. And then, eight in modern. I did not test it, <laughs> right? But I considered all the people asked me, first is open law policy. It's much easier to understand. But your vice minister, called Miller, they, he once asked me, oh, what means open law policy? How the open law policy in your education? Oh, I said, oh, I can give you some, some examples. He asked me the examples. The first day I have the meeting with him, and he invited some interpreter, but the interpreter is not so good. So I said, oh, to save the time, I can use English. Now I said, I continue that story. He said, oh, you don't, 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 don't use it. You speak very well, a very good English. I said, no, I just use it as a do. I said, yesterday we talked about that. Today I can show you the case, the open door policy. I said, the United States must be the largest country who is speaking English as a mother tongue. And I believe China is the largest country with a population who learn English. I did not test that. Maybe it is true. China has a more, much larger population who learn English. From all the schools, from the primary one to the university professors have to pass examination in English. This is our open to open our policies. Why? We want to learn the new, latest, I mean, approaches, experiences, and knowledges from all the countries. Right? So behind that, how large the energy, how much the time, 
how much the money, how large the manpower spent on education and English, right? So this is a global policy. And then the second, we have the long-term development plan. We have, you see, very important educational plan, plan in 1985, plan in 1993, plan in the year 20, uh, uh, 2000, the year, I mean, 2010. So in the plan, we can know our direction, where we should go, and know what kind of steps we should have. So this is important. So our educational policies are, we can say, consistent, right? Consistent, one by one, for, for several, I mean, certain directions. So this is also very important. The third is the curriculum reform I just mentioned. We have already three rounds of uh, reform. First round is for decentralized, because the different states, provinces, the cities are different. So, in, for example, in Shanghai, we have our English, educa uh, English courses in the primary one. In some in the land, they can have the English from the primary three. But they have a more agriculture knowledge for, for their, their children. So different, right? Our country is too large. Then the second round is modernized. We have a lot of modern courses. But the latest one is innovation uh, driven. So we have three rounds of curriculum reform. Then the fourth, modern teaching approaches were introduced into China. Yes, in these days, so we introduce a lot of foreign use for uh, traditional approaches, not only the rule learning. So in the PISA, we found that after their questionnaire, the children's questionnaire and teacher's questionnaire, OECD found Shanghai students use both Western modern approaches and also the traditional Chinese approaches. The root learning reciting is only one of them. So it totally changed. The Chinese students are very, very good in the understanding, in the summarizing. They said, oh, how can? I said, oh, we just try to let them to know. We introduce those kind of approaches to them, right? Introduce them. So the fourths are very important. Uh, the fifth, fifths are very important because all those are rely on the teachers. So the teachers' professional development are very important. Now all the countries, even the Britain, last week or uh, last month, sent seventy-two primary math teachers to Shanghai. They asked me to give them the training and they led them to visit our schools. Not only that, they said, oh, it is not enough. Asked me to send 60 primary math teachers to England. I said, how can I do? <laughs> right, our school, I need teachers. At the last I sent 30 to England. Now they are working there for one month and show some models for them. Yesterday evening, BBC have the program about that, right? So we have a lot of devices to invite our teachers to have their in-service training and uh, professional development. It is a whole long, I mean, very long time career. You cannot say only based on the four years of higher education, right? Then the sixth is tackle the low performance schools, low performance schools in various ways. We have such kind of saying, we call it empowered management. That means empower some NGOs, empower some school principals, empower some schools to help the poor schools. So that's very useful. That's very useful. Some American people said, oh, this is uh, your Chinese socialist way. I said, no. I, in fact, I learned something from Philadelphia. Because in the end of last century and early this century, you have some new companies, educational companies, to manage the schools. I said, sometimes the companies are good. They are more efficient. But I remind you, not all the educational problems are on efficiency. If only on efficiency, you use, a, you use a factory or use a company to manage them, that's good. But we have other problems, right? So we try to invite some educators and the NGOs to help them. Then Finland delegation said, how can one school principal manage several schools? 
I said, it's easy. Your Nokia controls all the country, uh, all the world, right? I have a lot of branches. Some businessmen can manage many, many branches. So some good school principals can manage their own schools good, well, and also to give some suggestions, advices, and uh, train the teachers, their schools, into our own schools, so we can share. So we have a lot of uh, problem, a uh, lot, lot of such kind of devices. Even I said that. Some officials in the United States asked me, how can you tackle the bottom? We said in China we have such kind of saying, if, if in the river the water is going on, I mean rising, then boat will be even higher. So I believe that. So we always try to help the poor schools. Even the poor schools getting higher, the better schools will be even higher, right? But if you only pay attention to the top schools, but the low schools will say, oh, we are hopeless, right? So it is different. Then the vice minister asked me, how do you tackle Nick, the, the, the poor schools? I said, oh, I know that Clinton and uh, Obama, their children in the private schools. Whether your school or your children in the private or pri public ones, if all the intellectuals, all the powerful officials, all the rich men send to their children into private schools. The public education always have no money, right? Professor, right. our time is up, but yes. you can't leave us hanging, so you have to tell us what 7 and 8 are. All right, 7 that, the transformation of local educational levy into some rich, rich district to the poor, and a quarter, we give some 30, 30 quarters of the enrollment places to low performing schools to the best, student, best schools. And in this way, the morale of the teachers in the poor performance schools will be there. The families will be confident, believe there, the students will work hard. So in this way, the, the best students, even in the poor, I mean low performance schools, they were working very hard because they will come to the best high schools, right? So these are the secrets. And after that, Friedman wrote a paper, <laughs> said Shanghai Secret in New York Times. Right. Well, congratulations. Right, yeah, thank you. So, thank you.